us. Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and welcome to this uh, second of the three lectures uh, on uh, to the memory of George Mossi. Uh, it's uh, for me an honor and a pleasure to introduce Michael Maris. An honor. Well, I don't really have to say what to say why. I mean, uh, all of you know. Uh, how important uh, the contribution of the distinguished historian who is sitting next to me did to many, many fields uh, in which he wrote the major books, the most important works, those works without which you just can't know anything about those fields. You want, you're interested in the history of the Jews in French, French Jewry, so you have no choice but to read Michael's book on uh, modern Jewry at the time of the Dreyfus Affair. You're interested in France during World War II? Well, again, the book he has published with uh, Robert Paxton, a pioneer book, is still the best one. You wonder what happened to the historiography of the Shoah? No choice. Again, you have to read the best survey the best historiography, uh, 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 historiographical survey uh, on uh, the uh, Shoah. And again, you read Michael's uh, uh, Holocaust in History. And I could go on with that. But it's on, not only an honor, it's a pleasure as well. It's a pleasure because we've been friends for many years, so many year, years that I don't even t want to tell you how many. Since the moment while I was uh, making my very first steps in the academic world, and Michael was already Michael Maris, and I will never forget that uh, he behaved towards me as if my research record was as rich as his own. Uh, you will agree with me, that's, that's not something you encounter very often, and it just shows that he's not only a great historian, he's a mensch. Now, well, I talked enough, so uh, let, me, uh, let me turn to Michael, and he will, his talk today will be on analyzing justice, restitution in law, and history. Michael. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't mind, I will speak from here. This is uh, perhaps a more informal basis for exchange, and I hope we will have exchange uh, following uh, my talk. R Rene, I am, uh, Rina, I am so uh, moved by your introduction. It is certainly established to everyone present that I am not the president of Italy. <laughs> uh, but I do, Rene, have to make uh, one correction. Your own book, on the Holocaust in France, and most particularly one that is not yet in Hebrew, relating the experience of Jews in France to the resistance, is, I think, an absolutely splendid work. Uh, it is a long work, as all of René's books are, uh, but I could not recommend it more. And let me say, René, I am happy delighted to pass the torch to you. <coughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, good friends, last time I tried to set the stage for the restitution campaign in the United States in the 1990s. <coughs> and I referred in a cursory manner to the story of Swiss banks, German industry with respect to slave and forced labor, insurance, and art. And I attempted as well to set these issues into part of their context, the legal context. Let me begin still pursuing this issue of context with two questions which I think are very frequently asked about this process. The first question is, 
Why did it take 50 years? And one hears this question. Why did it take 50 years? I would say this is the most frequently asked question about the restitution campaign. Why this late concern for stolen money and wealth, asks Elie Wiesel in his preface to Stuart Eisenstadt's book on Holocaust-era restitution. Now let us be clear. This is not, if I may say, an innocent question. It implies a grave accusation. The accusation is that practically nothing was done until the 1990s, that this was a great injustice for which there must have been responsible parties. The question rests on an assumption that for an entire generation, statesmen and national leaders evaded redress of one of the greatest crimes in history, turning a deaf ear to reasonable appeals to restore what had been taken from the Jewish people. How can this be explained? Well, the usual explanations are the post-war shortcomings of the victors over the defeated Axis powers, their widespread non-recognition of the gravity of the Holocaust, their incomplete and unenergetic denazification, their preoccupation with the rise of the Cold War, and ultimately their lack of sympathy for the Jewish victims of wartime genocide. However, I want to challenge the principal assumption, namely that nothing was done for 50 years, and this is one of the things that I want to talk about in this lecture. That's the first question. And the second question is, and it was asked, at the time. Why now? Why the late 1990s? That's the complementary second question. The restitution campaign was not predicted by those who wrote about a broadening Holocaust consciousness in North American culture, at least, in the 1990s, and those who sought to explain it. Restitution I did a little survey myself, restitution had no place in a collection on history and memory of the Nazi era published in honor of Charles Friedlander in 1997, for example. The subject hardly appeared in Peter Novak's book, Holocaust in American Life, published in 1999. And it had little or no place in the burgeoning literature on the memory of the Holocaust until the Israeli historian Dan Diener began to bring some disparate themes together a few years later, and he therefore is a pioneer. I confess that I myself, when I wrote an article called The Holocaust in the Courtroom, published in Yad Vashem Studies, and based on a lecture that I gave here in Israel in 1997, I completely ignored the subject. Why then the late 1990s? I think it's an important question. Now in order to provide some background to these two questions, and in order to uh, provide some support for the critical view that I take of the first of these, I want to begin with a look backward. A look backward from the 1990s. Let us begin with the war itself. Immediately after the war, people, I would say, were overwhelmed by the urgency of relief for the newly liberated. I'm speaking of the Jewish survivors in particular, the emaciated, shattered survivors of camps and forests and hiding places and death marches, the displaced and broken remnants of European Jewry who remained in deep distress. Relief workers were swamped. Statesmen had never seen anything like it before. Preparations were thin, and relief institutions had to be hastily improvised. 
those who felt an obligation for the survivors thought first in terms of relief, and only then, if at all, of the limited possibilities of restitution. The word restitution was not so commonly used. What one heard much more often was a word that echoed from the First World War, reparations. And reparations were understood, following the legal convention of the day, to be a matter of interstate negotiations and payments. Following the immediate provision of emergency aid and then the giving back to survivors of some property when possible, there would be agreements on reparation that would be written into peace treaties. The defeated powers would pay reparations to the victorious states who would in turn make payments to individuals. Basically, reparations were then seen less as a matter of justice to individuals than they were as part of the restoration of a global equilibrium, the construction of a new world order. This is, I think you will all understand and appreciate, the model of the First World War, which is what people talked and thought about at the end of the second. Looking at reparations this way, I should add, raised a particular problem, which not everyone was certain about how to deal with. And the problem was how to provide reparations to victims who actually had been citizens of the defeated power. How was that problem to be solved? In examining this, it occurred to me that it was important, and in order to fully uh, round out this picture, to look at what Jewish observers at the time actually thought. And there weren't many of them, but there, were a handf there was a handful of far-sighted individuals, I would say a tiny number, who ventured out of the iron cage of the terrible wartime slaughter to consider compensation for the Jews. Sholem Adler Riddell, a German Jewish refugee leader in London, first wrote about this subject in 1939. Nachum Goldman, as early as 1941, made the case for reparations at the Pan American Conference uh, of uh, the World Jewish Congress in Baltimore. And thereafter, a few took up the issue as oppression worsened. As one historian notes, the term Wiedergutmachen, referring to restitution for the victims of the Third Reich, began to appear in discussions and very modest publications, mostly by refugee Jews around 1943. But those who wrote about this subject were scattered, literally scattered. Adler Rudell wrote from London. Svi Schreiber and Siegfried Moses published in the Yeshuv in Palestine. Louis Bial and Herbert Dorn wrote in Havana, and Nehemia Robinson and Hugo Marx in New York. But beyond that, there was very little agreement and very little discussion. Focus, I repeat now, was on relief rather than restitution or compensation. Commentators were in uncharted waters, and moreover, their work seems to have had little or no impact on the few American and other officials who were concerned with post-war reparations during the war itself. Immediately after the war, East and West failed to establish a common policy on Germany and therefore on reparations in the first years after the war, with the result that two German states emerged in 1949, the Federal Republic of Germany in the West and the German Democratic Republic, or the DDR, in the East. And each had its own approach to compensating the victims of Nazism. In the East, there was scarcely any recognition of a distinct obligation to Hitler's Jewish victims. And even after the establishment 
of the DDR, the very idea of restitution was considered a bourgeois holdover of capitalism, linked with stereotypical associations of Jews with capitalism and private property rights. In the DDR, restitution and reparation meant German payments to the Soviets and to the Poles in compensation for the colossal damage that they had suffered at the hands of German fascism. Jews from abroad who inquired about restitution of German assets in the Soviet-dominated DDR did not even get the courtesy of a response for the most part. In the West, a different story. Restitution, however, took a second seat to the reparation demands of the Allies, but the return of Jewish property inside Germany, sometimes charting new legal ground, made some, though incomplete, very incomplete progress. The next major step, I think it is uh, well known here, were the Luxembourg Agreements of September 1952 between the State of Israel, the Federal Republic of Germany, and spokesman for the Conference on Jew Jewish Material Claims Against Germany, an umbrella organization representing 23 Jewish organizations headquartered in New York. These set the path for payments for Jewish victims' material losses. The results of these agreements, as you know, were bitterly contested, especially here in Israel. And yet they were also regarded as unprecedented at the time. And I stress that. Ben-Gurion referred to these agreements as a miracle. You and I have had the good fortune to see two miracles come to pass. The Prime Minister is supposed to have put it to Nachum Goldman. The creation of the State of Israel, one miracle, and the signing of the agreement with Germany. I was responsible for the first, said Ben-Gurion, somewhat modestly, and you for the second. The only difference is that I always had faith in the first miracle, but I didn't believe in the second until the very last minute. This agreement, I should add, was accompanied subsequently, that is in the 1950s and 60s, by close to a dozen agreements with governments outside the Soviet bloc intended as restitution for their formerly persecuted citizens. So, three conclusions to this point. First of all, the sums that were paid pursuant to these agreements were not trivial. And this reflects back on the first of those two questions I pose rhetorically. The sums have been calculated it's very difficult for, complex, for specific reasons, uh, complicated reasons, to, to make those calculations, but the sums amounted to as much as $70 billion going up to the 1990s. Not trivial. Secondly, these were, these payments, this restitution, was the result of top-down negotiations. Nachum Goldman, the Claims Conference, Conrad Adenauer, top down. And of course, my subject is the reverse, bottom up. We'll return to it, but top down. Thirdly, third conclusion, these agreements, or rather this process, sowed the seeds, I believe, of a future misunderstanding. To many Germans, all of this activity was understood as a settling of accounts. But for many Jews, the account could never be settled. And so, however satisfied the negotiators may have been at the time, and you've seen Ben-Gurion's satisfaction, and it was certainly shared by Nachum Goldman, the various settlements were before long deemed to be incomplete. And as such, they spelled trouble for the future. That was a brief look backward. Fast forward now to the 1990s with some effort to address my second question. 
why then? The most important factor, undoubtedly, was the end of the Cold War and the transformation of Germany from two states into one. The treaty which achieved this is known in diplomatic parlance as the two plus four agreement or the treaty on the final settlement with respect to Germany. It's a treaty that was negotiated in 1990 between the Federal Republic of Germany and the German Democratic Republic, or the DDR, that's the two, and the four powers that had occupied Germany at the end of World War II in Europe, France, the United Kingdom, the United States, and the Soviet Union. And this treaty was seen as tantamount to a peace settlement, thus opening the door to previously rejected claims that had been postponed until the final peace settlement that would end the war. And here it was. So the door was then open and was opened legally, as we will see, to litigation uh, that would bring this subject uh, to, a, to a close. Let me add as well, associated with the end of the Cold War was a new moral climate. The end of the Cold War engendered a new receptivity to addressing the wrongs of the Third Reich, some of which had been postponed while that long conflict between uh, the Soviet Union and the West had uh, been underway. And with this as well, the end of the Cold War came new documentary sources that were then available to substantiate claims that were uh, increasingly made in the decade uh, to follow. New documentary sources, therefore, and new successor states, which had their own claims now to press. Uh, successor states from the former, of the former Soviet Union that had new claims that had not been addressed in the intervening period and which uh, received the backing of the American uh, administration of Bill Clinton. So, end of the Cold War. Very important. Generational changes as well. And historians have looked at this in different countries. Uh, I drew uh, importantly for me on uh, the historian Regula Ludi, a historian of Switzerland, who talks about generational changes in Switzerland and calls to re-examine calls that came from within Switzerland itself and even before and just as the Swiss bank's affair was uh, was unfolding in Switzerland to re-examine and criticize some of the received wisdom with which that generation in Switzerland had been uh, educated. NATO and the European Union now thought about expanding eastwards and with this there were calls to harmonize settlements that had been worked out at the end of the Second World War. And another factor, bitter warfare in the former Yugoslavia and in the 1990s forced Europeans and others to confront memories of genocide even as they contemplated its continuing manifestation. And similarly, the mass slaughters in Somalia, Rwanda, Eastern Zaire, Liberia, and Angola underscored Holocaust-like failures of humanitarian intervention and the threats posed by such conflicts to international peace and security. Terms like ethnic cleansing, humanitarian intervention, responsibility to protect. All of these evoked memories of the Holocaust and put restitution to some degree on the international agenda. International agenda. And with this I come to another element summed up in one word, globalization, which began to be talked about so intensely in the 1990s. The increasing global orientation of business, uh, its consumers and its critics, and much of the uh, legal processes that had been used in consumer, uh, in consumer law were now turned to uh, the litigation that I discussed uh, last time. So globalization of business, but globalization also of issues 
of human rights. Again, part of the climate and the rhetoric and the agenda of the 1990s. The mid-1990s were abuzz with human rights concerns internationally, part of a human rights consciousness that has been uh, referred to as, quote, the emergence of a moral cosmopolitanism. During this period, restitution, therefore, uh, was floated on all of these uh, global developments. But now I turn to other elements of context that I think, uh, and I will cite them briefly, help explain the 1990s and why this came forward then. There are specifically American issues that I will briefly mention here. These are, if you like, the proximate causes, the immediate causes. And the first uh, I talked about again last time, the initiative. I mean, individuals do count, and the leadership of the World Jewish Congress, I think, was very important in pressing this issue uh, on the American domestic agenda and assisting the uh, resolution once, uh, of these issues once litigation was underway in American courts. Specifically, I'm speaking, of course, of Israel Singer and Edgar Bronfman at the head of the World Jewish Congress. Uh, various reasons uh, one can refer to, and I, I will not elaborate, the personalities of these two men. Uh, very uh, activist in orientation. Uh, Bronfman uh, eager to um, uh, establish, if you like, this is perhaps an unkind critical assessment, but keen to establish a raison d'etre for his organization, the World Jewish Congress. After the Soviet Jewry campaign, well, what was going to be? Why did we need a World Jewish Congress? There had to be an issue. Bronfman was there to press it, and Israel Singer was there to make it happen. And these are two quite uh, tough customers, if I might say, uh, used to getting uh, their uh, way, their personalities. Um, and the personalities, I might add, of a, of a, a more activist a generation of American leaders who gained the support of the Clinton administration, again, as I s indicated last time, extremely important uh, it was the Clinton administration, after all, that appointed Stuart Eisenstadt to uh, nurse this uh, process along and to uh, exercise his diplomatic skill, which went hand in hand with the legal developments uh, that I, I talked about. Uh, this would suggest that this was a capital D democratic process, but not at all. I also mentioned last time that Alphonse D'Amato uh, senator from New York, a bitter critic of uh, the Clintons, uh, particularly on the Whitewater scandal, uh, a man of the Republican right, but who had an important Jewish constituency or uh, Jewish presence in his New York uh, constituency and very actively uh, pressed the issue forward. And then finally, again, which I talked about last time, which I'll mention here again, the American legal system, which proved to be exceptionally receptive in the 1990s, as it had not been in previous decades, to the kinds of class action litigation, which, uh, based on the precedence of big tobacco, which won hundreds of billions of dollars, uh, I think a $200 billion settlement of big tobacco, you know, for people who claimed that they had been uh, poisoned by cigarettes and asbestos. Uh, so the American legal system quite different now in the 1990s and previous decades. And here, too, um, you find uh, a basis for uh, a, this transformation in the 1990s. The environment was right. Now, at this point, having said something about these two questions, I want to return to one of the themes of, with which I began my lecture last time. 
And that is the almost instinctive worry and fear among some, not all, Holocaust survivors and others that all was perhaps not right with this campaign. Indeed, that the Holocaust might somehow be twisted out of shape through the restitution process which I'm discussing. What accounts for this concern? That's the third question I want to say something about. What accounts for the concern? What accounts for the concern has to do, I believe, with what is at the very core of this restitution campaign. At the very core, in the 1990s, and this is whether one is talking about banks, German industry, insurance, or even art, at the very core is the idea that the Holocaust was not only the massacre of a people, perhaps the greatest genocide ever in history, but also the greatest robbery in history. The core has to do with the focus on robbery. The Holocaust, as Stuart Eisenstadt wrote, probably the greatest crime against humanity in recorded history, but also history's greatest robbery. Robbery of personal effects, property, including art, insurance, and the right to compensation for labor, and ultimately dignity. Now there are statistics that can sustain such a generalization. Losses of Jewish assets have been estimated. It's very difficult to calculate, but there are ways of doing this, and there are experts who look into the matter between 143 and 215 billion in today's dollars. Elaborating on the theme of theft, let me just refer to one uh, moment in a lawsuit, a lawsuit against the German industrial firm of Simmons, uh, launched by a group of plaintiffs headed by uh, some named Pollock, maintaining as follows. The Nazi SS stole their lives. Swiss banks stole their money. European insurance companies stole their insurance claims. Some companies stole their gold fillings. And the Pollock claimants claim the defendants stole their labor. Well, you see how the rhetoric goes, and my point is that while some were, some felt that this was an unexplored area of justice seeking, others were upset. Abraham Foxman of the Anti-Defamation League, himself a survivor who survived hidden in Poland, expressed this fear, and he said it. I fear that all the talk about Holocaust-era assets is skewing, that is, misshaping the Holocaust, making the century's last word on the Holocaust that the Jews not died not because they were Jews, but because they had bank accounts, gold, art, and property. If you repeat it enough, you establish as a fact that the reason the Jews were killed was because they had money. Now, no one actually said this. And in the article, which I read over and over again by Abe Foxman, well, it prompted my question, well, what do you propose or what is your alternative? But that wasn't the purpose of his article. I think the purpose of his article was a cri de coeur, a kind of expression of unease, which I think was widespread. It was based on feeling. I want now to look a bit more closely 
at the substance, at the historical facts, and the point which I want to try to make is that there was a significant disconnect between the history of the Holocaust and the contentions of part of this campaign for justice for the Holocaust, based on the Holocaust as one of the great robberies, if not the greatest, in history. I begin with the observations of a German historian, uh, who's actually, as I have learned, uh, visiting Israel as, as I speak, uh, the historian Goetz Ali, who has written an extremely important book on uh, Nazism as the agent of European-wide theft. Uh, in this book, recently published uh, in English, Goetz Ali states that one of his aspirations for writing this book was to correct Stuart Eisenstadt's contentions in Eisenstadt's memoirs on the Holocaust-era restitution campaign. Now, Goetz Ali's concern is not that attention to the robbery of Jews would crowd out mass murder. Foxman seems to have said that, but Ali's concerns are a bit different. His concern, his unhappiness, is that the plunder of European Jews, as reflected in the restitution campaign, suggested that that plunder was mainly the work of the leading elements of German industry. And I quote him, world famous companies like Daimler-Benz, Volkswagen, Allianz Insurance, Krupp, the Bertelsmann Publishing Group, and BMW. Ali seeks to redirect attention to ordinary Germans and to the spoliation of Jews that was an inescapable part of everyday life in the Third Reich and in which massive numbers of ordinary Germans actively participated and certainly benefited. Most of the loot, Ali argues in his book, went not to these giant corporations, but to the state, to the German war chest, as he puts it, as did the dispossession of entire populations of European countries. In turn, the state passed the benefits on to the German population. One example, only one, and I just uh, pull it uh, almost at random from his book. It has to do with packages. In the depths of winter in 1943, while the Fairmacht was suffering catastrophic defeats on the battlefield in the Soviet Union, Soldiers of the 18th Army near Leningrad managed, according to statistics from the post office, to send more than three million packages home. These packages were filled with items that had been plundered and bought at bargain prices or left over from food rations. Loot taken from the local population and sent back to the right. Three million packages in 1943 alone. You see where I'm going with this. It is, and I'll repeat an observation of Hannah Arendt made years and years ago when she said that there existed not a single organization or public institution in Germany, at least not in the war years, that did not become involved in criminal actions and transactions and looting. Everyone was doing it. The entire nation was a beneficiary. So my rhetorical question is, well, how is the law to contend with this? When complicity is near universal, 
and when wrongdoing is more often than not a question of degree to be examined everywhere in a society, how are those to be found liable ident to be identified? And how is the degree of their responsibility to be established? It's a problem. Well, let me go a bit more deeply into it, because the law has an answer to how you deal with this. And it finds the answer in the context of the litigation which I talked about last time. Swiss banks, German industry, insurance. There is a common theory that unites the cases against the defendants in all of these cases. And that legal theory is the theory of unjust enrichment. Now, with apologies for entering into some legal theory, I'm going to go down this road just a bit. And the reason I am is that unjust enrichment was the most important theory advanced before the courts in all of these cases. The issue of unjust enrichment is the legal accompaniment of the case made on behalf of those seeking restitution and to anticipate I think it is an excellent example of how history can be misshapen in order to fit the idiom of the law. What is meant by unjust enrichment? Remember, this is before American courts, and so one turns to an American statement. It is the statement of the American Law Institute in 1937, which declared, it's a simple proposition, and let me quote it, a person who has been unjustly enriched at the expense of another is required to make restitution to the other. End of story. If you are unjustly enriched, you must make restitution, period. Look, these were complicated cases. But as so often in the law, there is a simple proposition from which the great uh, legal tree is grown. One encounters over and over in the rhetoric of the claimants, of the plaintiffs, and in those who write and who have written about the process of litigation that I have discussed, the claims of unjust enrichment. I refer to my friend Michael Basler, who is, I think, the leading legal authority in the United States writing on uh, this subject. He expresses it very succinctly, and I quote him, financial giants worldwide, and he uses a metaphor, are sitting on billions of dollars in funds made on the backs of World War II victims which they invested and reinvested many times over the course of the last century. They are sitting on billions taken from the victims, Jews and non-Jews, I might add. And to use another metaphor, which one frequently finds in the law, they must disgorge it, which means, you know, pulled from their throats through litigation. Again, what happened during the Holocaust in this narrative is the wrongful transfer of massive amounts of wealth from the victims resulting in unjust profits to the defendants. Now what's wrong with this? Well, I would say there's nothing wrong with the first part of the proposition. Uh, no one disputes the first part of the claim that property was taken 
from Jews and from non-Jews, wrongfully resulting in unjust profits to the defendants. Well, just a moment. That second part is what I want to focus on. It's not the wrongful taking of property. It's not the theft. It is the issue of the defendants, and it is the issue of the property. I'll leave aside, and I don't think I have to pursue this uh, further, the very detailed efforts to calculate the losses and to demonstrate the losses. The leading authority here, by the way, is Nehemia Robinson, uh, brother of Jacob Robinson and the person who did exhaustive research in 1943, 1944, and published a book on, on this, I think, in late 1944. But how, and this is the legal question, how to identify those responsible? Very briefly, I indicated at the beginning last time the different ways that historians and lawyers examined this question. Uh, we'll leave historians aside for the moment. The lawyers, when they bring these accusations to court, for reasons that I talked about last time, want, indeed need desperately, to win. And therefore, they choose defendants who have deep pockets, that is, who have the resources to make important settlements, and who match certain legal criteria that the court will find acceptable in order that such litigation may progress and a settlement can be achieved. There's a term for this. The lawyers choose defendants uh, who are not necessarily the most guilty, but through uh, claims which are the most actionable. You see where this leaves the issue raised by Goetz Ali of ordinary Germans. This is not a matter for ordinary Germans. This is a matter, as Lenin would say, for the commanding heights of the German economy. Oh, and not all of the commanding heights, I think I indicated last time, didn't I, that, for example, Volkswagen could not be sued. Why? It wasn't that Volkswagen, such as it was at the time, not making automobiles, but making munitions for uh, the Fairmacht, uh, Volkswagen was actually an arm of the German state. It was a branch of uh, Kraft durch Freude. Uh, it was part of the German labor front and an arm of the German state through the Nazi party. As such, it could not be sued because of the doctrine of state uh, immunity. And so other German companies, say BMW, Daimler-Benz, okay, but not Volkswagen. Okay, well... Another problem. Most of the forced, let, let us talk about forced laborers now for a moment because we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people even uh, in 1990 able to make the claims. Most of the forced laborers living at the time had actually worked in German agriculture. Uh, Götz Ali has some data on this, but uh, and historians who have studied uh, this, uh, Ulrich Herbert, for example, most worked in German agriculture or for companies that were no longer in existence, small workshops, for example. Of course, all the way up to the giant corporations. Well, let's talk about agriculture for just a moment. Present-day German farmers. Present-day German farmers, uh, highly dependent on subsidies just to keep afloat, uh, as, as an industrial uh, operation, German farmers did not today consider themselves remotely liable for uh, crimes uh, committed by their um, professional predecessors, if you like, uh, during 
during uh, the war. Um, you see my point here. It's doing the, it's the difficulty of doing what the law requires, and that is to, an est to establish a connection, an identity between defendants in the 1990s and perpetrators in the 1930s and 40s. How does one establish that continuing identity? May I say now that for the lawyers, this is not so much of a problem. It's not easy for them, but they do have a way of dealing with this through what they refer to as a legal fiction. You know, the legal fiction is that there is a continuing corporate personality. Uh, Simmons in 1990, Simmons in 1940, there's a corporate personality and we have a notion of a legal fiction. Now, fiction is a word to which historians are allergic. We don't like fictions. Uh, we don't get on well with fictions. We do the opposite of fiction. Let me just briefly pause here to uh, refer to an example that I often uh, discuss with my students. It's a, a philosophical issue showing sometimes the difficulty of identity. And it was first uh, raised by John Locke, I believe, having to do with his socks. Do you know about John Locke's socks? He had a favorite pair of socks, and he had a hole in the sock, and the, and the sock was darned. And then he had another hole in the sock, and the sock was darned again. And pretty soon, the entire sock was made up of repair. The philosophical problem is, is it the same sock? Um, well, philosophers are bothered by this. Historians may be. Uh, but, I, <laughs> but, but lawyers not always, or usually not, I would say. And, uh, well, it, it is simply a, a problem. Uh, r uh, people have written about this. John Stuart Mill, I discovered, wrote about it. He wrote about the difficulty establishing connections over a very long period of time. He wrote, and I quote, because, uh, I quote him because he talked about justice and injustice. With the injustices of men, wrote John Locke, as with the convulsions and disasters of nature, the longer they remain unrepaired, the greater become the obstacles to repairing them, arising from the aftergrowths which would have to be torn up or broken through. Because of such difficulties, some have considered, and the legal philosopher Jeremy Waldron writes about this, that rights, especially rights to restitution, are capable of fading. He uses that metaphor. Rights can fade over time. It's an interesting metaphor because he doesn't say the right is invalid, but rather the right loses its concreteness. Anyway, he says, rights are capable of fading in their moral importance by virtue of the passage of time and only by the sheer persistence of what was originally a wrongful infringement. Uh, the historian Gerald Feldman, the late uh, Gerald Feldman, who wrote about this and particularly through uh, the in giant insurance company, the Allianz, was regularly uh, distressed by some of the legal briefs that established responsibility with a degree of clar clarity that he, as a historian, found uh, so difficult uh, to, to um, uh, maintain. The briefs in some of the class action suits Feldman wrote sometimes make me feel that our worst history students have decided to go into law." Unquote. Who 
is responsible. Well, that's not really the question raised in these lawsuits. The who doesn't really obtain because, of course, the leaders of these companies, the perpetrators, those who actually made the decisions at the time, are long gone. They've long passed from the scene. Their companies have often merged with others. The Volcker Commission for Switzerland, the commission that looked in great detail at all of the banks and and, uh, and uh, uh, banking companies that were being held responsible for uh, dormant accounts, had been involved in more than 100 mergers since 1945. Sometimes the companies split, split into fragments, explicitly terminating liability for past wrongs. Sometimes they had been transformed through their experience under communism. Sometimes they had cast their lots with other companies. The captains of industry in 1990 were a completely different lot. Again, I think I said this last time, than those uh, Germans who were running these corporations in uh, 1945. There are often American trained, internationally attuned modernists, far cry from their Nazified predecessors of more than half a century before. Many had simply no idea about the history of the companies they directed. And that's one of the interesting things about it. They, 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 did, they were shocked, astonished that their companies could be held responsible for crimes in 1945. And it was their ignorance which was importantly at work in uh, driving their, uh, their uh, first reactions to uh, this litigation. You can imagine that when the American companies, Ford, General Motors, were sued for what their German affiliates did by way of hiring uh, slave labor, their reaction was similar. What? Ford? Of course, there was Henry Ford, but, but they felt you know, that that was long behind them, even forgotten. Uh, General Motors, not even burdened with uh, Henry Ford's um, uh, own responsibility for the virulent uh, 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 promotion of the protocols of the elders of Zion. One of my colleagues and friends, uh, Professor Peter Hayes, has done research on another theme that comes up again and again in the charges of unjust enrichment and in the restitution campaigns before the court, namely that the key to all of this lies in the enormous profits that were generated through forced labor and slave labor, or for that matter, through insurance, although he doesn't get into this uh, at all in his, uh, in, in his own research. As a matter of fact, his research rests on one company, Degusa, a giant chemical corporation that not only used slave labor, but was also responsible, among other things, for the production of the deadly cyclone gas uh, that murdered Jews in Auschwitz and some other uh, camps. The more I explored, now I quote Peter Hayes, who is a critic of the notion of profitability here. The more I explored Degusa's history under the Nazis, the more I thought the firm had engaged in acts that extinguished or gravely damaged the lives of many and for which it clearly owed at least the survivors something. Okay. But that it had not made much money directly from any of these deeds, indeed it probably in the aggregate lost some. Hayes has provided a detailed critique of the notion of profitability. Now, I hasten to say we don't know enough yet about this. To what degree was the Holocaust not only a murderous enterprise, but an enterprise of enrichment, and if so, for whom? Uh, this research remains to be done, although bits and pieces uh, remain, but let me simply say that the issue is is open for challenge. 
that there were great profits piled up. Uh, most often what happened is that if there were, if there was profitability by uh, these uh, corporations, that was virtually wiped out in the Allied aerial bombardment uh, in 1944 and 1945. And what put these companies back on their feet again was not the wealth piled up through the confiscation of the valuables of uh, murdered Jews and, and, and the civilian population of Europe, but rather through American support during the Marshall Plan, which raises another whole set of, of problems. Uh, let me sum up this section with the observation of a legal academic, Anthony Seabach, whose work I find, I have found quite helpful, identifying the problem as he sees it. And I, I agree with what he says. The problem is that the language of unjust enrichment buys into a rhetoric and a vocabulary which fundamentally commodifies the wrong because ultimately claims in equity for unjust enrichment are about replacing and returning lost property. The claims are not about violations of human rights. The claims are not about the destruction of a culture. And the claims are not about the oppression of a people. They are about returning property that has been wrongfully taken. And thereby, in his view, the law gets the history wrong. Let me briefly now refer to another theme which I develop in, in uh, the book that uh, accompanies these lectures, and that is the question of corporate responsibility and how we should understand it. My own view, again I jump to a conclusion, is that the corporate responsibility should be understood less as analogous to the perpetrators in criminal litigation and much more analogous to the role of bystanders during the Holocaust. Bystanders during the Holocaust. What do I mean by this term widely used by Holocaust historians? By the term I mean those individuals, companies, institutions, governments loosely defined who were neither perpetrators, nor collaborators, nor victims, but who, being present in some sense at the destruction of European Jews and aware of what was happening, did not intervene in any meaningful way in the process of mass murder, or even worse, became part of a vast apparatus of exploitation and persecution and murder. The great scholar of that vast apparatus, or the pioneering scholar, is of course, was of course the late Raoul Hilberg. And it was Hilberg who taught us to see things, I think, in those terms, a vast a apparatus of exploitation and persecution and murder. What do we know about the motivations of German industrialists? Forget, forget the industrialists of the 1990s, Harvard Business School, not knowing about their, the history of their own companies. <coughs> what about the industrialists at the time? Peter Hayes now. Making money was not the reason the Reich's increasingly counterproductive, cruel, cumbersome, and chaotic program of labor exploitation came into being. And it is neither morally nor historically sound to measure its evil by its lucrativeness. And he goes on, precisely because the slave labor system emerged from a vortex of macro-political, not micro-economic forces, international law consistently has defined the German state and thus its citizens collectively as the primary party responsible for answering to the financial claims of people exploited under Nazism. You see the point here? I think it returns, at least if you buy into that historical 
uh, argument, which I by and large do, although the jury is perhaps still out, but if you do, then I think you may see some sense in the point repeatedly made by German executives in charge of the major corporations in the 1990s, hauled before uh, American courts, that the German government had already made reparation payments on behalf of the German people, or even if you don't buy into that, that, that the German people or the German state should be the responsible agent, just as uh, for, for these civil wrongs, just as individuals were responsible agents uh, brought to trial in criminal proceedings. It at least, I think, uh, makes the point, which I feel most comfortable with rather than a black or white point, uh, it, it, it makes uh, the argument of um, the, um, ambi uh, the, the uh, ambivalence with which uh, we might approach uh, the uh, question of responsibility. Uh, a defense attorney, let me cite a defense attorney named Kenneth uh, Bialkin, a, a Jewish attorney who found himself defending uh, the big insurance company Generali, uh, an insurance company which was uh, a major um, defendant in the, uh, in the lawsuits against uh, the insurance company in, in, in uh, the process that I've described. Um, and, and he received uh, a good deal of uh, criticism for having undertaken this task, a separate subject. But his observation uh, makes a good deal of sense, I think, as he talked about the defendants for whom he worked and uh, the unease with which he himself uh, s saw their uh, responsibility, or the unease with which he approached the subject of their responsibility. The more I got into it, Bialkin said, the more I fe felt that Generali and others were being pressed and tarred with the anathema of the Holocaust and asked to pay money which they didn't really owe in amounts which bore no relationship to what was fair. I saw there was a kind of terror in the community. All you had to do was accuse someone of some peripheral involvement in World War II and they bring their attitude toward the Holocaust to anyone who is so accused. The irony was, he, he uh, described, that these executives, perhaps uh, uh, men, almost all men in their uh, 40s and 50s, were addressed by the, de by the plaintiffs as if they had been actors in the 1940s. Let me now take up my final uh, point, my final theme, I've talked about defendants, and I've talked about the, the uh, problems, uh, uh, my, perhaps my own ambivalence in understanding their responsibility, but let me in conclude by talking a little bit about the claimants now, uh, about the survivors, and I want to introduce a theme here, a little bit different from the theme that I have talked about, but I think it's an important theme, and that is the theme of diversity. The diversity, the extraordinary diversity of their historical experience, which I fear is also lost in the litigation, which r requires, almost requires, a certain notion about who the claimants were. Let me begin with the practical problem of how these claimants were assembled. Remember, last time I talked about the class action basis for this litigation. They had literally to be rounded up. They had to be identified as individuals and uh, described in documents submitted 
before the court. In all, it was estimated at the time that there were some two million survivors around the world, Jews and non-Jews, who appeared somehow uh, on the scene, Jews, non-Jews, victims, and their heirs, those who had been in camps and ghettos, but also those who had been forced laborers, and those who claimed bank accounts, or those who claimed that they had insurance policies. In the Swiss bank's settlement, notices prescribed in the rules for the American courts went out around the globe, and an astounding 584,000 questionnaires were returned. The most sophisticated system was not actually developed for the Swiss bank's affair, but rather for the insurance litigation under the international commission known as ICHEC, which I described last time. ICHEC developed this system, and its staff produced packets of information and claim forms available in 20 languages. It established a website and a 24-hour call center with toll-free numbers in New York and extensive language uh, capabilities when people called in to those call centers. Anticipating approximately 20,000 claims, remember these are for people who had insurance policies or claimed they had insurance policies uh, before and during the war. In the end, ICHEC received more than 100,000 inquiries coming from more than 30 different countries in more than 20 different languages. And uh, I mean, I, I think, by the way, the lawyers get uh, something of an unfair uh, rap, to use the vernacular, on this. Remember, the, the legal, uh, the, the, the claimants had to, had to fund this, and the, law, and the law firms had to fund this outreach. Uh, in, um, and, and let, let me also stress that uh, we're talking about Jews and non-Jews. Indeed, non-Jews are the majority in these cases, and especially in the, uh, I should say, not in all of these uh, uh, cases, but especially in the, uh, in the uh, sl uh, forced labor um, uh, litigation in, uh, and negotiation in the United States. Um, East Europeans uh, rested their case on the devastation of uh, the countries uh, and territories from which they had come. Uh, the uh, Jewish uh, victims uh, stressed uh, the uh, uh, racially motivated persecution and the fact that most uh, Jews in, in, who, who were slave laborers uh, uh, were destined to uh, be murdered through the process of labor. How is this all to be sorted out? In the end, in the end, the negotiators distinguished between two classes of workers. Again, I've described this last time: slave and forced laborers. The former being survivors of camps and ghettos, and they received ultimately seventy-five hundred dollars. And the and 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 the forced laborers, who worked under extremely variable conditions, uh, received some twenty-five hundred dollars. Now, these are token payments, but uh, may I say uh, these payments are made around the world and $2,500 went actually quite a long way uh, in Eastern Europe, even uh, at the time. Repeatedly in the course of uh, these, uh, in, in the course of the campaign, Holocaust survivors told their stories. Survivors spoke before groups of lawyers, press conferences, public meetings, government officials, congressional committees, regulatory bodies, and the courts. And I'll have something to say about their testimony uh, next time. Sometimes, sometimes they were deeply and movingly gratified by the opportunity to speak, valuing the small measure of justice that they were seeking or satisfied for the recognition that he, they had finally received. Sometimes they spoke about their sheer unalloyed 
need for restitution. This was mainly in Eastern Europe where there was uh, significant impoverishment among those who had survived. Sometimes they were angry as well, convinced that it had taken far too long for their cause to be recognized, and sometimes they put the emphasis on getting the record straight. <laughs> I'll return to this next time. But differences, extraordinary differences, and differences, now let me make this point, among Jews as well. Sharp divisions between those who claimed survivor status by virtue of having escaped persecution and murder through emigration, flight and hiding, and those who suffered in camps, ghettos and forests. There were bitter disagreements between com communities of survivors in the United States and in the Soviet Union. There were also disagreements over whether any of the money secured as restitution should be spent for Jewish educational, commemorative, or Holocaust-related projects. Bitter disagreements here as well. Perhaps, I'm concluding now, perhaps it is appropriate that when the claimants finally spoke, they spoke with many different voices and that their terrible experiences were not easy to categorize or to enlist in one or another settlement scheme. As Peter Hayes observes, the category of forced and slave labor itself, with this big division, which was not easy to achieve, that division itself covers an extraordinarily wide spectrum of circumstances for both Jews and non-Jews. Considerable differences arise concerning everything from daily treatment and nourishment to ultimate chances of survival depending on whether the laborer was a Jew, a non-Jew, male, female, a civilian, prisoner of war, a ghetto or camp inmate, could or could not speak German, came from Western or Eastern Europe, and whether he or she had to toil in Germany or the occupied East, in agriculture or industry, directly for the SS or the Fairmacht, in a state-owned or private-owned enterprise, in large or small enterprises, and in construction or mining or on the assembly line. How possibly to resolve all these differences through a crude formula? It was impossible. Impossible. But it was only superior, as many people came to realize, to not making an effort to make distinctions at all. Finally, and with this I do conclude, as every Holocaust historian knows, the destruction of European Jews is moving from commemoration and memorialization and also justice seeking into history. By definition, a realm of complexity and ambiguity and analysis and is becoming more and more the province of historians and others trying to make sense of what happened rather than the advocates of individuals seeking justice for themselves and their fellows according to some formula. Justice seeking is inevitably drawing to an end. Meanwhile, the effort to understand continues. Thank you very much, Michael, for this very, very challenging lecture, which raises a lot of questions. We have some uh, 15 minutes, something like that, for questions from the floor. So. Considering the thoughts uh, and uh, comments, he wrote a number of articles about the from you referring to. There was one, quite ironically, in the Wall Street Journal. Yeah, uh, this is it. That's the one here. Uh, but he also made a point in that article uh, that, uh, of course, He's the head of the, of the defamation league. It's very important to understand what his contemporary issue is, uh, combating anti-Semitism and anti-defamation, and that the emphasis on raising uh, again all this money uh, simply reinforces the uh, cliche or the, uh, uh, the false uh, image of Jews only being interested in money. That's what, uh, 
uh, say comment. Uh, my, my question, uh, I'd like your comment on the, um, the issue of restitution being an educational and instructional mechanism to keep the Holocaust before a rapidly changing public. A recent Gallup poll, Gallup poll does this I think every two or three years, I think now something like 20% of the American public doubts that the Holocaust took place. And that, that number has been increasing and will continue to increase. And there's a limitation on what movies can do and, and uh, uh, academics can do. Uh, the the uh, preoccupation with money may well be a, uh, uh, a good mechanism to keep the Holocaust before an increasingly disbelieving public. Um, thank you for your question. And it is not an easy one. Uh, let me say uh, just a few things. Um, Foxman, it is indeed in the Wall Street Journal, um, and he seemed to me in the article to be a worried Abe Foxman rather than an Abe Foxman who had a clear sense of where this was going. And I think uh, he was certainly astute enough to appreciate the response that was made on the issue of money. Well, there were several responses. And by the way, I'm going to take this up directly next in my last lecture. But the immediate response was, look, if you um, slip on a banana peel in the subway, you can sue the subway company. Why should, so if it's a small, trivial uh, wrong, you get compensated. Why should there not be compensation when it is an enormous wrong? I don't know if there's an answer to that. He was, you're absolutely right, concerned that there would be a kind of anti-Semitic backlash. Um, and in a way, your question is, uh, or your comment seemed to reflect the idea that the response to this is that this is a pedagogic exercise, and in the end, it'll come out all right. Well, I don't, I don't worry about alienating the alienated. You can't worry about people who are anti-Semitic because there's nothing rational about that. So consequently, you have to worry more uh, about a public that is not intrinsically anti-Semitic, but is simply ignorant. Okay. Well, I, I appreciate that, and I, I think you may well be right, but consider the main theme that I'm pushing, that you don't get good history from this. In fact, the history is distorted. And uh, that's been the theme of my lecture and will be the theme of my book. And uh, I have to say that the lawyers who argue before the courts uh, don't always get the history wrong, but very frequently they do. Um, and I tried to give, you know, some examples of it. You would think from their litigation that the German corporations were the main engines of persecution. And in a way, this takes us back to some of the uh, East German interpretations of the Holocaust, that this was, uh, that the Holocaust was actually driven by uh, capitalism and uh, by German industrialists. Well, we don't believe this very much now. So the history is not right. Uh, I don't, please don't misunderstand, I don't derive from this the idea that the whole thing should never have happened. But I think uh, one needs to take great care and frankly, his, here's my credo, history is best done by the historians and not by the lawyers. Uh, and, and if I could say one final thing, there is, I find uh, in the legal imagination and partly in the imagination of many claimants, the idea that if you get 
a positive resolution, somehow you've scored. You know, you have advanced the cause of Holocaust consciousness. But please remember my point in the first lecture. These issues never really were decided by the courts. In the end, they were decided by negotiations and bargaining. And in the end, by, in the case of the Swiss banks, say, by threats of boycotts and you know, all sorts of things. And in the end, the defendants decided it just wasn't worth it to continue the fight, and so they cut a deal, which is the way the, this kind of litigation almost always ends, like about 90% of the, 95% of the time. Richie? Well, I was wondering, and I'm glad in the end that I heard you saying this so clearly, um, because even Michael Basler uh, in his work is making the claim that litigation is not the way to go for restitution. Um, but I'm interested in how you would put these two things together. You're saying it doesn't make good history, uh, but maybe restitution is not involved in history. Maybe restitution is involved simply in restitution. And that um, one should not be concerned with history. If I feel that I fell on this banana and I want to get my money, I should get it. Why should I be concerned with history? Well, uh, Richie, it, first of all, uh, Michael Basler, uh, we disagree, but he, uh, he's a great friend, uh, and he's offered some good criticisms, which I always take to heart, uh, and he's helped me, I think, understand this process. Uh, but he does believe in litigation. He's a litigator. I mean, he teaches this stuff. He loves this stuff. Um, and I think if he were here, I would say, Michael, you know, uh, look, um, next time I'm going to get into this uh, in a lot more detail, but let me anticipate. I don't like to anticipate all. But what is in the litigation, what is the most common expression made by the claimants? What is the most common expression? I've read an enormous um, amount of this stuff. And uh, let me tell you, my candidate. Are you ready? It's not about the money. It's not about the money. So then I ask, well, what is it about? Well, and then and, and in my next lecture, I'm going to unpack this a bit more. What is it about? Well, a claimant will say, it's about justice. I understand, in my book, is entitled Some Measure of Justice. But what is understood by justice? Before long, you get to history. The effort on the part of the claimants to see acknowledged and registered by an arm of the state, namely the courts, a historical uh, account of persecution and mass murder. History, you may say, why worry about history at all? You and I may agree, but we're not going to court. Those who go to court care and care deeply about history, in my experience. And also fear, let me add, that history will be either forgotten or distorted or denied. Even these descendants of the descendants? Especially sometimes the descendants of, and even with art, which you're, so, which, which you're very interested in, I want this established as a painting that belonged to my father. In the end, they'll sell the painting in order to pay for the litigation, but they want that history established. People care about history. I think. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, my question, perhaps you've answered it in your previous lecture, but my question is comparative. I mean, according to what you said, and where the basic principle is unjust enrichment, what is the, what is the difference, is there a difference, between um, the Holocaust and any other political, um, I don't know, political event 
which evolved into some kind of robbery, and we know that there were, it's not the only uh, political event that evolved into such a, 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 a such circumstances. And if that is so, um, like we have in our region, are the the, the questions that are on, are on the table, and and colonialism is a big. Uh, project of loot or um, slavery which comes up over and over again and there's some minor ones in, in, in regional uh, conflicts and uh, is there a real, when, I mean you derive the principle of all these um, processes from the small banana you know uh, in the subway so is there any differences in principle and if there is not I have two other questions <laughs> Rather, if there yeah, you when you, so that's it. But if there is not, um, so why did this whole thing of restitution come up on global scale with the Holocaust? And the second one is there, I mean, other crimes that are now coming up in the legal sphere um, for restitutions? This is, this is an excellent question, and this is the very last uh, part of what I have to talk about. So I will be talking about this. Let me uh, anticipate. This is an excellent question uh, because the uh, assumption that I detect in your question that there is really no difference. I mean, there should be no difference uh, in terms of claims. Colonialism, slavery, absolutely. And those people who have focused on Holocaust era restitution we talked about Professor Michael Basler, believe that it is a template for other kinds of restitution for great historic wrongs. As so often, for various reasons, partly because it is the most complete genocide of which we know, and partly because, as well, it is the most fully documented by far of any genocide for which we know, the Holocaust has become a template for the study of others, and so it is with restitution. So, uh, for example, the book that we've been discussing, uh, Michael Basler's book, um, uh, Something Justice, I've forgotten the exact title, but his last chapter has to do with uh, the case for Armenians. Uh, who are who have unsuccessfully, but nevertheless they will continue, sued uh, German insurance companies. Uh, black slavery in the United States. And this black slavery preceded the Holocaust era restitution, but it's more difficult because it's farther in the past, and what is especially difficult is who you sue. But that doesn't stop, you know, clever lawyers are, you know, they find, that we'll find a way. And so they keep trying, and they use some of the legal rhetoric and some of the, and some of the uh, case uh, law in order to pursue their claims. Now, if you ask me, is there something wrong with this? Well, I think you know what I think. <laughs> uh, I mean, th the law was developed for the banana, not for genocide. This is something new. I mean, to, to turn the common law of unjust enrichment, which concerns, you know, you go to England in the 17th century, my sheep was in your field, and my, and, you know, the sheep ate your grass, or whatever, you know, the, these are these classic cases from which you develop and you build up a common law, which, a case law, which is refined and refined and developed and so on, but it was never intended for historic wrongs on the scale that we're talking about. So what happens when you do that? Well, some lawyers applaud this and think it's a great step forward. I am mo much more skeptical. And the reason, mostly the reason I'm more skeptical, I think, is that I'm a historian, not a lawyer. And I see that there is distortion that comes into the historical picture when you use this law intended for one set of purposes to another. But that's the way the law works, and you know it does develop over time, and it, it was used for with you know hundreds of thousands of people in tobacco cases, but it's different with tobacco, I think. 
Anyway, Raoul Teitelbaum. Yeah, it's going to be the last question, I'm afraid. Uh, actually, the conclusion can be that any legal system can deal with Holocaust and the results of Holocaust. And the historical analysis made that clear because any of agreements, and there were some, many of agreements dealing with the reparation for, uh, for a survivor or of Israel, were not results for any legal procedure, but for political compromises, beginning from, from the uh, agreement, uh, uh, Luxembourg agreement, the, the first German uh, law for uh, uh, Nazi, uh, uh, but in any of these uh, uh, agreements, and after, uh, after in the 90s too, every of these agreements have very uh, deep political elements. And the law was actually servants these political agreements. For example, I will give you an example. The BEG law, the first law for uh, uh, payment for Nazi, uh, they had two completely political uh, elements. First, it was the geographical uh, geographical uh, area in which this law is functioned. And all the East European uh, part of Europe was out from the law. The second example was that the monthly rents was connect, connected to be a part of German culture and language. It's a, 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 a clear political uh, condition. Um, your question is, uh, or your point is an important one. Uh, and it's one which I, I think I agree with uh, to uh, an important degree. And what you're saying is that there is an inescapable political element, an inescapable political element in what I'm talking about. But I'm afraid that uh, this is a process that is the process that involves settlements on the order of uh, $8 billion, uh, which, is, uh, which is framed in a legal language. Uh, and people um, either respect what was concluded or they're critical of what was included based on whether they are convinced that the legal claims were just. And I have to say that as legal claims, there are huge problems with it. That Volkswagen should not be brought to the table when Daimler-Benz is. That uh, you give the impression that, uh, not you, but one comes away with the impression that German industry is the principal agent responsible for the enslavement of European populations rather than agriculture and so forth. When you take away the ideological element, which we know, I mean, whatever our views about the Holocaust, we all of us historians consider ideology to be absolutely central to the process. But once you come into the court, it's profit seeking that is held to be central. And by the way, the focus on profit has all sorts of problematic implications on how you see the victims. I find this, frankly, a mess. 
And, and I would be far happier, as I think Stuart Eisenstadt would have been far happier, to admit from the beginning that this is a political issue. But that isn't the way the process worked. <coughs> and, uh, and I understand why it didn't work. It didn't work because the whole idea of restitution to individuals let me close with this because I think this is a, a radical statement and I'll provoke everyone for next time. The, the idea that after a great historical wrong, individuals who survive or their heirs will be compensated. This is new. And the Holocaust is, in a way, the pioneering event to establish this. In my country, Aboriginal people who were victimized, who are the victims of a kind of a genocide, and who, were, uh, who suffered a great deal, and who continued to suffer. There's not been any kind of compensation, although there has been a failed effort at national uh, reconciliation and national restitution. Um, slavery, black slavery, I mean, Armenians, I mean, you name, uh, you know, the history of mankind is the history of the suffering of peoples victimized by other peoples. From which of these events has there come a clear notion of restitution? Hardly any of them, but the Holocaust, with the Holocaust you get the slow and imperfect, highly imperfect evolution and development of a system of restitution. It is unjust, it is unfair, it is unequal, it is inadequate, it is imperfect, it leaves whole groups of people unsatisfied. But nevertheless, it is the beginning of a process which I think could develop further. Thank you very much. I feel very bad that you. We'll remain with this provocation. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you. Thank you.